Hello, my name is Dr. Nicole Kroom. I'm a board certified forensic pathologist and assistant medical examiner here at the Wayne County Medical Examiner's Office in beautiful Detroit, Michigan. This video is part of a series of videos brought to you by the National Association of Medical Examiners, or MAME, to teach the public what actually happens during an autopsy. The video series is split into multiple parts because the autopsy is complicated and also has multiple parts. So, warning, in this series I am going to be talking about death and what happens during a death investigation and autopsy. So if that's not something that you want to see or hear about, I will give you a few seconds to keep scrolling. As a forensic pathologist, my main responsibility is to determine cause and manner of death in cases that fall under the jurisdiction of a medical examiner or coroner system. And my main means of determining cause and manner of death is to perform a post-mortem examination, commonly referred to as an autopsy. Although, as I'll get into in this series, a internal examination is not always performed when a post-mortem examination is performed. A post-mortem examination can comprise of three parts. One, the external examination. Two, the internal examination, the part most commonly referred to as an autopsy. And three, ancillary studies, which are what we call extra testing that we send, such as toxicology or microbiology studies. In this video, I'll be breaking down the external examination, but to do that, I'm going to need help from our office, John Doe. And here is John Doe. John Doe is our office's teaching mannequin. They help us to teach our rotators, medical students and residents who are coming through our office to learn how to perform post-mortem examinations, how to perform an external examination before they get to their first case. For those not in the know, forensic pathologists have to go to medical school. After medical school, we complete a pathology residency, which is either three or four years long, depending on which specific track we choose. And then we have to complete a year-long fellowship in forensics, which gives us our specific experience in medical legal death investigation. So essentially, the external exam is us performing the final physical exam that a person will ever get. Similar to how your physician performs a physical exam when you go to visit them for a routine checkup. As indicated by the name, the external examination is an exam of everything that we can see externally. So what we can see without making any incisions into the body. The external examination serves multiple purposes, but I'm going to try to break them down into sections to make it a little bit easier to digest. As I mentioned earlier, my primary responsibility as a forensic pathologist is to determine cause and manner of death. One of my other responsibilities is to help with identification of decedents, decedents referring to our patients who are deceased. In that vein of identification, the first big group of things that I'll talk about that we document on external examination are physical characteristics. These are things such as eye color, hair color, whether or not there's facial hair, whether or not clothing is present and a brief description of the clothing or at least documentation of the clothing via photographs. This can be especially helpful in cases of missing persons where we receive a decedent with an unknown identity but can match it to the description of clothing that a missing person was last seen wearing. Once we've documented the clothing, it is removed from the decedent so that we can visualize the whole body and conduct the rest of our external exam. After the clothing is removed, it's collected and typically released with the body once the postmortem examination is complete. In cases of homicide, the clothing may be bagged and given to the law enforcement agency as evidence. Other physical characteristics that can be used to confirm or establish a decedent identification include things like tattoos. So we typically denote the location and a general description of the tattoos, or at least take photographs to document them. In addition to corroborating or establishing identity, scars can help to provide a roadmap for all the medical and surgical interventions that a patient may have had in their life. This can give us insight into their clinical history and a potential cause of death. 
Jumping to our next category of things that we look for in external examination, medical intervention. For example, it's an endotracheal tube. It is used to help establish an airway in patients who are having difficulty breathing. Or things like electrocardiogram leads, which are placed on a decedent to confirm that there is no more heart activity. And it's important for us to document the presence or absence of these medical interventions because they can often be mistaken for injury. We can also check to make sure that there were no therapeutic complications from any of the interventions that we see. In addition to the decedent's physical characteristics and any medical intervention, we also look for any signs of natural disease. I mentioned earlier that scars can be an indication of medical history, but we also look for things like rashes, uh, devices that might be implanted under the skin but still palpable, such as dialysis catheters or uh, cardiac monitoring devices that act as a defibrillator um, and can shock patients' hearts and give us an indication that there was some sort of heart disease. Uh, so all of those things can play into our differential of what might have caused the patient's death. And last, but definitely not least, we look for evidence of injury. In John Doe's case, we can see here that there is a little dried out abrasion. And an abrasion is a type of blunt force injury caused by removal of the epidermis or outer layer of the skin. This type of abrasion with the yellowing, actually typical of postmortem. As we continue down along Doe, oh, we see here another abrasion, this one is a lot more red than the one that we saw on his chest. So this looks fresh, um, so more anti-mortem appearance. So we would document the presence of this injury on our diagram. Now the types of injuries I've shown in this video are things we commonly see on people whose cause of death has nothing to do with traumatic injury. I know myself, I probably have five or six bruises on my leg just from walking around and bouncing into things. So we do have specialized procedures for measuring other types of injuries like gunshot wounds, but that is outside of the scope of this introductory video. If the case is a homicide, the external examination is also an opportunity to collect certain types of evidence, such as fingernails for possible DNA evidence. And we wanna document all indications of decomposition as decomposition can also impact our external examination. Uh, for example, if a decedent is severely decomposed, it might be impossible to see any sort of external injury due to the degradation of the skin and soft tissue. As I mentioned, the external examination is a full head-to-toe examination, which includes the backside of the body. So we are always sure to turn the decedents so that we can make sure they don't have any injuries or physical characteristics or evidence of medical or surgical history on the backside as well. Well, there you have it. Thanks for sticking with me for this basic introduction to the external examination. As I mentioned, this is only one in part of a series about the post-mortem examination, which can comprise of three components. The external examination, which we went over today, the internal examination, which I will be covering in a later visit video with the help of my beautiful anatomic model, Bueller, and ancillary studies, which comprise of things like toxicological analysis and microbial studies. We don't always need to do all three parts in order to determine a cause and manner of death. Sometimes just an external examination with some medical history will suffice. Sometimes both the external and internal are performed, but no additional testing is sent. In a full and complete post-mortem autopsy though, all three will be performed, an external, an internal, and some ancillary studies. So thank you for joining me, and if you have any questions or comments, my name is Dr. Nicole Kroom, and you can find me on social media on Instagram at everybodydecomposes. See you next time.